Um, and we're allowed to our uh, ortho mentor group uh, webinar sessions. Uh, to, my name is Shwan Hanari. I'll be moderating today. Um, our uh, first presentation will be by Faras Arnout, uh, followed by one by Hussam Albani. In the first session, this session, we'll uh, stick to Faraz. If there's some time at the end, we'll take questions. And of course, if there's even more time, we'll take a hot seat question if possible. But uh, then we'll get a, get a second invite to start the uh, second session with Hussam Alban. Um, everyone, very welcome. Faraz. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. I'm Firas. We will talk tonight a first topic about hip dislocation, hip replacement dislocation. It's a very commonly asked question and very commonly tested question in the FRCS. <clears throat> Obviously, my acknowledgments are to the group. And we just want to say, I'm not here to teach you anything you don't know already. I'm just here to give you a teach you a system of how to structure your answer for the exam. As I said, it's commonly frequently tested question in the adult pathology viva. You would like it to be asked by a non-hip surgeon. So if you use the right terminology, you could very easily impress them and score very high. <laughs> there is no one right answer as any, any other question is really what they're testing is that you have a safe, systematic approach. It could come into two, into two um, different scenarios. It could be the examiner can ask you, you know, about a dislocated total hip replacement, which is the most commonly asked one, or they can tell you, you are doing hip replacement at the end of the procedure, you find the hip is unstable. What will you do then? So one of these comments, two, two scenarios can come in. Um, you'll, the survivor normally starts with an X-ray like this one. The examiner will show you this and say, tell me what do you see? So what you say straight away, I would like to take a history and examine the patient. Please avoid the temptation to bombard the examiner with questions at this stage. Make it brief and crisp. History. I'd like to take a history, specifically asking about the time since the index operation, about the number of dislocations, about the mechanism of each dislocation from first one to the current one, and about the medical comorbidities. Everyone knows that you are a competent doctor who can take a very good detailed history. You don't need to go into full details asking examiner about various things. These are the main points that you need to focus your history on. If the examiner thinks that any of this information is relevant, they would normally volunteer this information to you. So please, please avoid the temptation of saying how many dislocations, how many, what is the mechanism? Don't ask examiner questions. Just say, that's what I'm looking for. Then you move promptly to examination. They like to take history, asking about these four points. Then I would like to examine the patient, looking at the position of the limb, at the neurovascular status, and at the mental test scoring of the patient. If the examiner thinks that any of these points are relevant, for example, they, you can, they, they will volunteer this to you. They will tell you, oh, the patient has sciatic nerve palsy. You've shown the examiner you'll want to look for that. Don't waste any more time on this. Then you move on promptly to investigations. Very briefly say, I would like to see the previous radiographs of the patient with the hip located. And also I would like to have a lateral radiograph of the dislocated hip. So you, you moved quickly. You've shown the examiner very quickly and briefly. You are a safe, sensible surgeon. You're not scoring any points yet. So the quicker you can get through this, the better. Not more, ideally, not more than 30 seconds. And the examiner shouldn't have to talk much about during this period. And then you move on now to scoring. 
the examiner doesn't have to ask you what you're gonna do. You could just volunteer that because you know that's what the station is about. It's about your understanding about the management of hip instability. So you could say the examiner, I would like to reduce the dislocation. Please don't start going into details about how you're gonna reduce it. I've heard a lot of candidates, they start asking, saying, I'm gonna call the anesthetist, I'm gonna check the starving status of the patient. Please don't go into all this. We know, examiner know you are, you know about these minor details. Just straight away say, I would like to reduce under sedation or under general anesthesia with the anesthetist backup. And then I would like to search for the cause. And now you're starting to score points. And the quicker you can get to this stage, the better for you. So, reduce management, reduce and search for the cause. The cause, there are three factors, patient factors, surgical factors and implant factors. And once you get to these, the examiners will relax. And you are really here in your way to pass this station. So please get to this within the first minute or two, not in the last 30 seconds. So patient factor, the easier ones, and you can get them out of the way and score points for that quickly. Gender, in fact, the patient factor are gender. It's known that the female to male ratio is two to one. Again, for any of these factors, if you can back it up with evidence, if you find a paper to back it up, you will be obviously um, gaining more points. Um, so gender, female to male ratio is two to one. Neurological conditions, if a patient has any neurological condition that causes soft tissue laxity and muscle weakness, it, it will weaken their abductor mechanism, reduce the stability. Patient compliance, alcoholic patients, cognitive dysfunction, dementia, uh, poor anatomy, Poor anatomy, either from re previous multiple revisions, if it's revision surgery, or from previous infection or trauma. Poor anatomy will cause um, compromised abductors, which also will impair the stability of the hip replacement. So these are the patient factors, okay? You get them out of the way, there's not much to talk about them. Um, so you get them out of the way, you show the examiner, you're actually not blaming the patient, you make it, Somehow clearly not blaming the patient for dislocation, but you are considering the patient factors. Then you're moving on to the surgical factors. And now here really you are going to the higher level of, of, um, of thinking, higher order thinking, uh, which is ex ex uh, FRCS level. It's known that the surgeon experience is an important factor. If you can pack the, it, it is also obviously reported in the NGR, and if you back it up with NGR data, you will be scoring high. So surgeon experience. Second is impingement. Impingement can be caused by osteophytes, which have not been removed during surgery, or from retained excess cement. And this can be seen on a X-ray. So if you find any of these factors evident on the X-ray that the examiner has shown you, you tell the examiner straight away, yes, I can see an osteophyte there. I can see a retained cement there. But that could be a factor, surgical factor. And then prosthesis alignment and soft tissue tensioning. We all know the proper prosthesis alignments of the cups, 20 to 30 degrees of antiversion and 35 to 45 degrees of inclination. There are studies uh, done, if you can back it up also, that will um, be useful. The stem antiversion is 15 to 20 degrees. If there are any doubt, you could always, if you're not sure if this, if this process is aligned properly, you could tell the examiner, I'm in doubt, I would like to have a CT scan. It's not, you know, you're showing you are safe uh, by requesting an appropriate further investigations. And here we can see the, how this prosthesis is retroverted instead of being antiverted and what will make it prone to dislocation. So prosthesis alignment is a surgical factor because surgeon control that factor. The other factor that surgeons have control over is, soft, is the soft tissue tension of the abductor's complex. And that's controlled by the controlling the offset. And there are two types of offset, 
acetabular and femoral offset. Most of us talk about femoral, but if you say to the examiner there is also acetabular offset, you are showing them that you are you fully understand what the hip offset is about. The acetabular offset can be so ideally to improve the stability, you need to increase the offset. The acetabular offset can be decreased by over medialization of the cup, and that could be seen on the X-ray. So if you see the X-ray, the surgeon has overreamed the acetabulum, you tell them, that's it, that, you know, explain that to the examiner, tell them, I think there is acetabular offset is reduced here. That could be a factor. Never com commit yourself to one single factor. Just say that could be the factor, the cause, because could be also the dislocation or instability could be also multifactorial. The other offset to talk about is the femoral offset. offset. And the examiners like this. They'll straight away ask you, if you don't volunteer it yourself, they will ask you, what is the femoral offset? Femoral offset, as you know, guys, it's a perpendicular distance. You have to say the word perpendicular. They'll be looking for that word, nothing for nothing else. Perpendicular distance between the center of the rotation of the femoral head to align down the center of the femoral shaft or center of the stem of the prosthesis. Okay, guys? Sorry, if you feel I'm going a bit fast, I'm trying to slow down, but if you feel I'm going too fast, the, the session will be recorded, you can view it later on. So I said increased offset will increase the abductor complex moment arm, mainly um, the gluteus medius. And it has been explained before in, um, a presentation by Schwann, how 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 um, the moment arm affects the force. So increasing the moment arm will decrease the force that's required by the abductors if they have a longer moment arm. And therefore, on the long term, will reduce the stress forces on the joint. So this is the positives of increased offset. The negatives is that it puts higher stress on the stem itself. Okay, and this picture here shows you an example of how offsets are different between an extended offset and a standard offset. So these are the four surgical factors, just to go over them again, is a surgeon experience, impingement, prosthesis alignment, and soft tissue tensioning. Now moving on to the implant factors. Um, one of the factors is wear, wear of the lining of polyethylene lining. And that could also be seen on the X-ray. If you see it, comment on it straight away to the examiner as an implant factor. The treatment for this will be exchanging the liner, obviously. The other implant factor is the head-neck ratio. Please try to use those terms, okay? They're really the proper terms. You'll impress the examiner and they will know that you know what you're talking about. So the head-neck ratio. Increased head-neck ratio is directly proportional to increase stability of the hip. Increased head-neck ratio will increase the arc of movement, which is the range of movements prior to impingement. So you want a large head neck ratio to increase the arc of movement prior to impingement. You can see here in this picture, the top image have a smaller head neck ratio comparison to the uh, bottom image. And you can see how the range of movements, the arc of movements in the, top, in the bottom one is 120 degrees and top one is 100 degrees. Therefore, the bottom one has to travel 120 degrees before it, it impinges. The top one has to have travel 100 degrees. So that demonstrates the importance of the head-neck ratio. So you want a larger head-to-neck ratio to increase the arc of movement prior to impingement. Don't need to say anything more than that. The examiners will be like looking at you and, and being impressed. 
The other implant factor is the head size of the uh, femoral component. So head neck ratio and the head size in itself in isolation is an implant factor. Head size will increase, increased head size will increase the excursion or the jump distance, which is the distance the femoral head has to travel to dislocate. You can see in this image how a larger uh, femoral head has to travel a lot more to dislocate in comparison to a smaller femoral head. Okay, so the head size is another implant related factor, very important factor. Okay, so to, to re recap again, we have three factors, patient factor, surgical factors, and implant factors. Um, the patient factors are gender, neurological conditions, compliant patient, sorry, non-compliant patient and poor anatomy. Surgical factors are surgeon experience, impingement, prosthesis, alignment, and soft tissue tensioning. And the implant factor are wear, head neck ratio, and head size. Now, the reconstruction letter for implant-related factors Obviously, if it's patient-related factor, we have to treat that patient-related factor, whatever it is. If it's surgeon factor, if there is impingement, we have, that has to be removed. If there is a reduced offset, that has to be corrected, most of the time surgically, obviously. You could put an implant that has a higher offset or extended neck. If it is an implant-related factor, it cannot, that cannot be adjusted. It has to be implant treatment. So, re, you know, change the implant in a, in a way or another. So there is a, I've put up this reconstruction ladder of um, reconstructing a dislocated hip replacement for implant related factors. So you start with normally with the most simple measure. You could use a lip liner could change just the liner, use a lip liner, which has the raised lip in the direction of the dislocation. That's why it's important to know whether the dislocation was anterior or posterior. Next measurement could be to put a device called PLAD, which is posterior lip augmentation device. Next step is constrained liner. And the Final one is dual mobility, and obviously revision hip replacement completely is, is, is the last resort. Um, I doubt it very much. Examiners will go into any more details than this. There won't be time anyway, even if you've done the best thing by getting here. And I think any further discussion is a more post-exam fellowship standards. Not So I think if you get to this stage, um, you'll be fine. So, my motto for the exam, always stay, stay, keep calm, stay organized, go from ABC. Examiners are testing your ability to cope with pressure. So it's part of the exam. So you have to stay composed all the time, no, no matter what's put in front of you. Even if you don't know the answer, try to stay sy sy systematic. And, and really, you have to show the examiners that you know what you're talking about. You have to save and you use the right terminology, right system, right approach. And you have the right, not just the right knowledge and the right amount of knowledge, but also the, the higher order thinking to use that knowledge in your day-to-day -day practice of the patients. Okay, so you have to show the examiners that you know what you're talking about. And that's all my uh, presentation. Uh, for hip instability. Well done for us. Any uh, questions, guys? It's very, very good for us. Uh, uh, excellent as always. You're, you're showing a, a really simple, straightforward way of answering this question with a lot of knowledge in very simple uh, words, uh, sentences. Um, if you guys just replicate that in your uh, examination, and remember the variations in this can be along the lines of 
what are the things you would consider in a hip replacement on a certain type of patient or a certain type of anatomy. And you can then again divide it into patient factors, your uh, surgeon factors, your implant choice. Some questions that have been asked uh, for us, um, or Hussam, or any of the uh, ortho mentor group, I notice Atar and Fouad Chaldry have joined us as well. So, first question is Should we consider head neck uh, ratio as a surgical factor as they are surgeon choice while wearing, while wear and loosening as implant factors? Yeah. I think that's a common, that's a, that's a very good question. And I, when writing this presentation, I thought about it. Ultimately, the surgeon has co overall control of most of the factors, um, even patient factors, because even a patient has neurological condition, you could say that the surgeon could have put a constrained liner straight away anyway. However, we, we this seemed to be the most agreeable kind of classification that I found, and they seem to be putting it under the implant factor. But yes, if you put it as a surgeon factor, because a surgeon control the, pro the prosthesis they are using, um, there's nothing wrong with that. However, surgeon doesn't always have control of the head neck ratio. There are implants, the monoblock implants, they come ready-made. And if that's the only implant you have on the shelf, then you don't have much control over that. Um, so, for example, in the days of Charlie and other things, the stand more prosthesis, they are monoblock. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them are not obviously all of them, but some are monoblock. You don't have a choice of head neck ratio. It comes as it comes. So um, that's why it's decided to put it as an um, implant factor. Another question is how, uh, from Ajit Medina, how do you measure combined version? Also, a very good question, and that's an advanced question. Um, the combined version, I would use a CT scan to measure it. Um, um, I, th I think it'll be difficult to, I'm not sure of any other way to measure it, but a CT scan. And a combined ver version is important also. So you, if, if one component is um, anti-verted, the other, for, or mal-aligned, let's say one component is mal-aligned, the other component can compensate for that. So that's the importance of, of, of combined version, okay? But I wouldn't volunteer that information in the exam. I would, uh, if the examiner ask, it, ask about it, I would say, yes, combined version is very important and components can compensate. And the way to test it is doing a, a CT scan. Mm -hmm. It's a, if, you're, if you're being asked about combined version, you've either gone a very difficult direction or you've, uh, you're already at seven. Um, so the other thing, if, if I'll just add about this combined version, it's more uh, relative to uh, when you do the revisions. Because sometimes the revisions, actually, you are tight about what you can, if, if you have loosening in the establum or you cannot put the carb or you have a fracture or you have all these things or or you have deformed uh, uh, proximal femur, or you don't have a proximal femur actually at all, and you are doing femur replacement or proximal re femur replacement, then then come uh, strongly into action that you have to have this 3D while you are putting use because you don't have any yeah. any guide how you're going to put these. <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Sam. Uh, next question is difference between lips and plaid. Um, yeah. Uh, so very simple but important the, if you want to note. Yeah, lip implant is just the liner itself. The liner has a lip, so it's a slightly raised on one side. Okay. So the lip implant is an implant that has a that has a, the liner of the implant has a small raised lip on one side, normally covers about a quarter of the, of the liner or, or third. Um, the plaid is a, an additional device that you use to supplement um, the, um, um, the, the, the acetabular cup on the deficient part where it's dislocating. So the liner, the lip liner is just a normal liner, which has a lip. The plaid is extra device you add to the cup 
to increase the coverage area of the cup to reduce dislocation. Sorry, I um, I, but, that, that I didn't bring uh, any images, put any images, I didn't want to complicate but, this. That's okay. Um, that actually, what, what you've put up is very good for us. I'm really uh, impressed by it. Um, so the uh, next question is, what is the meaning of acetabular offset uh, definition? Okay. I think you covered this already. But yes. Just uh, again, again this is an advanced question. The stabular offset is the, also the perpendicular distance between um, the floor of the acetabulum and the center of rotation of the hip joint. Um, or in, 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 to be more accurate, between the floor of the acetabulum and center of rotation of, uh, of the acetabulum itself. And the, the floor of the acetabulum is marked by a line that you could be asked about this in the exam, which is the ilio ischial line. So that's the perpendicular distance between that line and the center of rotation is called the acetabular, acetabular um, offset. Okay, um, we still have a little bit more time. Um, the, about 10 more minutes in total. So uh, does anyone want to uh, discuss any other questions or any other comments from our mentors? I just like to say this is a common, commonly tested question. I think you'll find a lot of, a lot of people have been asked about this. Definitely. It's, 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 gives, it's a gift, really. You don't need to say more than this. You, you can score really high in this question. This is one of those questions the examiner should not really talk at all. The examiner should just sit back and listen to you. So if, this question uh, uh, gets your understand. First of all, shows your ability to deal with a complicated situation and divide it into simple organized um, answers. It's also a question that uh, delves into your knowledge of uh, the operation and the prosthesis selection, and they can divert off into any direction depending on where the, the marks are in this question. I think also, as, as always, this is a general rule, and even you see when I, I present, and actually, all what Firas said, it's about basic science. So they, you can take them there. You can start to talk about them Okay, I want to, hey, yeah, I see here, I'll be a little bit concerned about the offset. And uh, for this, I want to first to do my templating. I want to see the limb lengths, uh, if there is any limb length discrepancy, how they were doing before the surgery. And this will affect the implant choice. And what about the head size? Because this will affect the excursion distance. This will affect the uh, the head neck ratio, and and directly will affect then the range of motion. And when I increase these and make sure that these measurements are optimized, then I am actually optimizing also by my outcome by decreasing the risk of uh, of the dislocation within the functional range of movement. These are the buzzwords. You need, yeah. you need to talk like these buzzwords. Yeah. And usually once you started to talk like this, the examiner, wow, he knows what he's talking about. You know, and all this from the basic science, not that you are a hip surgeon, you saw many hips or you did many hips. No, 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 this is the basic science. So always concentrate on this while you are reading, please. And you are winning, don't worry. Thank you. Thank you, so um, that's absolutely correct. Um, to say, uh, after this session, we will log off and we'll log in again. Shwan will send another link. Uh, it will be a talk by Hussam next. Uh, also, FRCS talk about um, periprosthetic fractures, another FRCS topic. And also, after that, will be hot seat session. Um, please express your interest in hot seat session. Send Shwan a message with your interest and also with date of your part two exam so he knows how to prioritize people we will try to offer more of these hot seat sessions in the future uh, just um, 
uh, we gauging it by interest from people and uh, i think interest is 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 increasing so we will try to accommodate that demand okay uh, all right, everyone. Thank you very much. We'll close a uh, couple of minutes early, uh, so you can all have a little tea break. Or get your tea ready. I'll send another invite in about three minutes or so. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Well done for us. Thank you. Thank Sarah. you, guys. Thank you. Well